Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your phones off. Then, if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his uh, presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming you, dear Professor Neil Ekronor. Uh, Dr. Neil Ekronor is a professor of accounting and the head of Department of Accounting at Monash University, Malaysia. Neil has spent uh, 20 years in uh, Hong Kong where he researched the modernization process of Chinese firms, examining issues such as performance measurement, order qualifications, and the trust. Neil has published two books, the China case boxes on operational risk and the management control of multinational enterprises in China. He has previously taught at Hong Kong University, City, City University of Hong Kong, is Hong Kong uh, and the National uh, University of Singapore. He has published, uh, has been published in top uh, ranking journals in accounting and management, such as the Accounting Organization and Society, Journal of Business Research, Accounting Horizon, Abascos, Journal of International Accounting Research, Australian Accounting Review, Pacific Accounting Review, Advanced in Management Accounting, Business Strategy and Environment, Journal of Applied Management Studies and Managerial Finance, Nail currently serves on the editorial board of behavioral research in accounting, uh, management uh, accounting research, Abascos, and uh, advanced in management accounting. Now we will start our seminar with the Professor Neil Okonwa. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, guests, joining me. I understand with the numbers that we have, happy to be interactive and, and actually take questions sooner after the first five minutes as I get the momentum go and explain to you basically what this study is about and basically we have data from the supplier blacklist and what does that mean if you're a researcher and you get you get access to proprietary data the biggest challenge as an academic researcher is finding a model in the literature that has looked at this type of data before well it's we find it was very difficult to find such a model. And actually the closest thing that we got to it was, um, let me just um, pull this PowerPoint going. The closest we got to it was the work of Chen and Lee. So Hal Lee from Stanford University is a huge analytical theorist in the area of supply chain and operations management. And their paper Management Science 2017 is probably the the best example of a foundation for what our data would be relevant to, because what Chen and Lee talk about is the concerns of the small buyer, the concerns of the SME, not necessarily the concerns of the multinational. So this is not a, a multinational business problem that we're talking about here. Multinationals deal with this all the time and they have oodles of resources to make sure that the problems I talk about tonight go away before they even start. But for the SME, there is a lot of challenges and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. That is the context. Ah, what else is in their context? Well, the objective function for those econometricians in the audience is supplier. We're trying to map the strategic opportunism construct and that is we define supplier fraud as where the supplier has actually they've agreed to supply you the goods from another country or even the same country and maybe you get a box of rocks they take your money and you cannot contact them you try and call them you no answer you try and visit them they're not at that address they're actually gone so it's a deliberate a deliberate, uh, op deliberate actions on the supplier to actually take your money and give you nothing in return. Now that's different from a myopic opportunism where suppliers maybe you know you put they're under pressure to meet a certain deadline, so they may take a short a shortcut by putting in some lower quality materials at the last minute because they cannot get the full quality material order that in order to deliver your product on time as they promised to you, like suppliers at the outset, they do act myopically quite 
often, but it's not like they set out to defraud you. And they, so we're differentiating those two different types of opportunism out there. And, you know, when you're contracting outside the organization, the opportunism is abound. And that's, you know, that's been the subject of decades of research, especially in the supply chain operations management. So what this study that I'm talking about tonight is about is, well, if these small buyers, if they have in place something like some screening mechanisms like selection, certification, factory audits, or some license verification, if they have some third party audits, if they are doing something to try and verify that the supplier is real, is it likely, can we predict that the opportunism, the strategic opportunism is actually lower when these governance mechanisms are in place. Ah, and that, that's basically what the paper is about. And, and of course, there are challenges with identification of you know, what is fraud and what is not fraud. And, and we can get into that discussion. And you know, there's a lot of work to be done on this paper as we go. But let's get back to the economic context. How relevant is this question? How relevant is it that we should be looking at SMEs and not multinationals. How relevant is that? Well, supplier fraud is it really a problem? Is it is it only a problem for Amazon power sellers? You know, like like buyer beware, caveat emptor. Like you know, you want to sell on Amazon. Well, you know, that's the risk that you take. Um, it's maybe you know this was the box that you put this type of study into two years ago before COVID. But what happened in 2020? We had these gyrations of supply and demand on PPE. And when you have huge gyrations in the supply and demand for a particular good from developing countries, not picking on China here, then there are opportunities for suppliers to take advantage of that. And it was amazing the things that went on in 2020. I'm talking about 2021, as it, it's still as bad this year as it was last year. But back when we we're talking about the supply of masks, there were more masks, fake masks produced than real masks uh, in certain months in 2020. And that was because governments around the world were racing to get PPE, not just for hospitals, but also for the general public to fit in with their policy mandates and dictates, what have you. And so therefore, when the government says that, you know, you need to wear a mask, well, then it's the obligation of the government to make sure that there are masks available to be sold in that country. And, you know, this was a challenge. And so suddenly there is demand for mil tens of millions of masks per week uh, flowing into China. And so what do the factories do or what happens? A lot of middlemen came up and they went to factories and they laid down millions of dollars to the factories and say, we want to buy your mask capacity, manufacturing capacity for the next six weeks or two months. And then those middlemen will go to the government around the world and then they sold the masks for two times, three times what the middlemen were contracted with those factories for. And the governments didn't even know whether they were dealing directly with the middlemen or with the suppliers. Now, that was 2020. And you thought, OK, 2021, we know that now. We're not going to make the same mistake again. Well, sorry, we're making the same mistake with nitrile gloves. So gloves huge in hugely in demand with medical services around the world and so you've got the vinyl gloves you've got rubber gloves but then you've got the surgical gloves that they call nitrate gloves and now there's just a huge demand for nitrate gloves especially coming out of thailand and there are instances of containers of nitrate gloves arriving in the usa where they are soiled they have been they're secondhand, they've been washed, they're dirty, they're not even new. And the buyers in the US have laid down millions of dollars with the contractors in Thailand. So, you know, and then even, you know, earlier this year when India just had that huge ramp up of COVID cases, there was a huge demand for oxygen converters, oxygen uh, creators. 
uh, from China. And back then, the factories just doubled the prices of those machines and the buyers were still willing to pay that price. You know, so you've got these gyrations of supply and demand. It creates opportunities for opportunism. All right. So, you know, two years ago, you know, supply fraud, uh, you know, that's just a problem of buyer beware. You, you know, if you're not a multinational, then don't get in the supply chain business. You know, so, but now we realize that, wow, this is, this is a huge problem. All right. When it comes home to the medical services in your country where they cannot get nitrate gloves, clean gloves from the supplier overseas, uh, something's wrong. And so therefore, in some ways, we can say that this type of study or this area is much more significant two years later. So maybe I'm am I thanking COVID for the significance of the study? Maybe, but I don't want to wish that on anyone. Uh, you know, and there's many headlines about the challenges of masks and the challenges of fraud. PPE fraud, PPE mean the whole gamut of personal protective equipment, masks, uh, visors, you know, coats, nitrate gloves, etc. So there's many, many articles about the fraud. And basically, it's come about because of the huge gyrations in supply and demand. Now, let's get back onto the paper tonight. All right. How big is the problem really? Well, it really is big when it comes to PPE. OK. All right. But before PPE and before 2020, it was still a problem, especially in the area of electronics, consumer electronics. It was very, it was, especially in the area of industrial goods, B2B, and also in other industrial type products. It was not as much of a problem in household sports equipment. And I'll show you some data on that later. Um, all right. So how, how real are these scams? Here's a real website. Here's a website. And this is a scam. And there are four pages I just want to show you very briefly. First of all, how can you know a website is a scam and not a scam? For example, this uh, tricycle motorbike has been sold by this company, but this company also is selling Segways. They're selling tricycle, motorcycles, snowmobiles, trek bikes. No factory is going to be selling a whole range of goods like this unless the factory is an international brand. So first of all, that's a big telltale. Let's go to the other part. How many people are in that factory? Well, they've got 80 to 99 people for R&D staff, 80 to 99 for QC staff. Uh, no way are they going to have that many people for a factory where, and the size below 5,000 square meters. And really, it, really for 10 production lines, you know, you, you only need 19 to 20 people per production line. So there's 200 in total, and they've got one to 200 people dedicated to R&D and QC. That ratio does not make sense. Let's go to the next slide. Look at all the different products that they're making on the bottom left-hand side. And then, of course, they always allow you to pay by Western Union because when you do Western Union transfer, it's very hard to trace and follow up. Ah, okay, so if there's nothing you get from my talk tonight about um, the theory that helps you with your research, at least I can uh, teach you how not to get scammed. Ah, all right, my big good friend, uh, Charles Kermis, who is the major importer and distributor of police body cams in the USA. So he's a major player when it comes to buying uh, electrical equipment from factories in China. And he's taught me a lot. I've known him for about six, seven years now. And this day when I met him, he told me about the power bank scam where you have a power bank and normally a power bank, uh, 10,000 milliamp hour power bank, it has a certain weight. And normally you catch out these scams by you make sure you weigh the product, what genuine product should weigh at customs before shipping. Well, what the supplier does is put a 5,000 milliamp hour cell inside this 10,000 milliamp hour shell. And then in order to keep the same weight of what you would expect from a 10,000 milliamp hour shell, they would fill in the rest of the cavity with sand. 
So when it goes to customs at shipping, then the QC inspectors are none the wiser. The weight matches what the buyer says that the product should weigh. Ah, right. So what the buyer failed to tell the QC inspector to do was to actually test the amp hour rate of a sample of power banks from the shipment. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's the buyer that is actually advising the QC inspector to check what to check and what not to check. Ah, here's a scam. I was talking to Charles at a trade show a few years ago where one buyer just laid down $200,000 and got a box of rocks. Like, and then several months later, the same thing happened again. And so these scams are abound because it's so easy through various e-commerce platforms to find a supplier. It is much more difficult to actually verify who that supplier is from a distance. And so just want to show you that just some of the background. And look, even if you went to go and visit the factory, and I can show you two factories here. Ah, so you see the materials. You see the materials. And I can say, okay, here are two factories here. And you go to these factories to buy a smartwatch. So I could ask all of you here, which one would you source from? And you probably think, yeah, but Neil, I'm not an operations expert, I'm not a buyer, but I, there's a lot of buyers out there that are not experts either. And that's the way the world is at the moment. People learn by making mistakes. And so I teach my students to look for a good factory versus a bad factory. Now, how many of you uh, put your hand up for the left-hand side that is the good factory or hand up a thumb up if you think the factory on the right hand side is the good factory. Can we have a, a hand or a thumb please? So a hand for the left hand side and a thumb for the right hand side. Sorry, participation, but not for too much. All right, we've got a few hands there. Any thumbs for the factory on the right hand side? Uh, Question from uh, Ling Han. Yes, please. Okay, so I just want to, you know, keep moving fast here. The factory on the on your left hand side uh, closed down about a month after I was there, and they continued to sell the smart watches, but they never told the buyers that they were outsourcing the manufacturing and the assembly. The factory at the bottom, what I found out and as I visit the factory was, is a better factory. And the reason is because they already had OEM experience with a major Japanese brand name. Okay, Sharp, making a product for a Japanese brand name. And so when you have the OEM experience, obviously it gives you a stronger DNA to have a sustainable business model for a you know, sustainable supply. And, you know, these are the little things that you see with a factory visit and it's sort of beyond what we're talking about in our study, but I just want to show you that a lot of buyers don't even get to visit the factory and they, they balk at the opportunity of paying 500 US dollars for an agent on the ground in China, in Vietnam, Malaysia, Pakistan, or anywhere developing country, developing economies around the world, just to go in and actually do, double check and certify is the factory real. Uh, and it's amazing how many buyers do not even do that. I'll give you an example. I talked to a third party audit provider, friend of mine. In the last decade, my friend and his company have undertaken 12,500 product audits. That is, buyers have come to him and laid down 300, 400, 500 US dollars, you know, about 250, 300 US dollars for a man day. So if you a person day, and if you have a, a large shipment and a large sample, it may be take one day or two days to actually check a sample. Buyers have no problem laying down money to check the product before shipment. Fine. Okay. But I asked him, how many factory audits have you done, your company done in the last 10 years? And the answer was, oh, we did about 500. So that's 
one to 25 difference. And a big message I do have when I talk to buyers is do a factory audit first, right? Don't wait till the product audit. It can be too late with the product. You, you saw that with the battery, the sand in the battery. And like even, you know, going back a few years ago with the... Yeah, that's uh, going to supply the wheels for the world. Here are two factories that are making identical products. Probably think, Neil, why are you showing me this? Again, I just want to show you that not all suppliers are the same. Not all factories are the same. As you can see now, I've got many hands. I can see that the factory on the top left-hand side is the better one. Obviously, they're going to be around, they're sustainable. They've got this idea of where every person that works in that factory just does one, two, or three different steps. Whereas the person in the factory on the bottom right is basically going through the 90 odd steps to make the whole hoverboard by himself. Obviously, the person on the right is much more experienced and knowledgeable than any of the workers on the left, but that's not how you make a sustainable factory. And so same products, the factory at the top was the first factory to get UL certified. What does that mean? When you are UL certified, you are able to be the first to actually ship these hoverboards into the US back in 2016, 2017, after 74 fires happened around the world in 2015, early 2016. Ah, you know, so getting these certifications from your supplier is a critical part of knowing whether the supplier is the supplier you should be sourcing from. Ah, okay, enough of the show and tell, and I can go answer questions about that. But let's have a look at some, you know, summary of, you know, what I was just talking about. Like, you know, in 2020, you know, the number of factories in China for PPE went from less than 10,000 to 28,000 within a matter of weeks. And it was just amazing that, you know, the supply just, just grows. Now, most of those factories that jumped into that sector were very opportunistic and you couldn't trust them. Most of the masks that were being made were really not what they were meant to be. They say, oh, ours is free ply. Ours has the bloat mold inside it. And like, you know, the average person wouldn't know the difference from a fake mask and a real mask, right? So, you know, lots of challenges here and I don't want to turn anyone off from sourcing, from developing countries. Uh, but we can talk about other scams is the classic on its way and milk the cow. If you still want to buy from uh, overseas and developing countries, then you need to know these. The classic one, you pay the deposit normally in the supply chain world, you pay 30, 40, 30, ideally 30 upfront. Why? Because supplier has to has some money to buy some raw materials, don't they not? Uh, 40 at the time of shipment, FOB, hopefully, and then 30 when it arrives in your port in another country. Ah, all, all, often those suppliers say, no, 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 we want 70% when it comes to shipment. You know, there's always that negotiation that goes on. But that's for the scam artists, they don't care about that 70%. They, if they can get that 30% and scam you, then they're off to the races. So they will take your deposit, ship nothing, you follow up and they're not answering your calls, emails or anything. That's the classic one. The second one, it's on its way. And that is, they actually do send you something and sometimes they send you something in a container. Why? So they can get the other 70%. Ah, wow. And then they'll send you a box of rocks. They may send you a box of used or copy products when you want the original. Ah, and you know, the reason why they send it to you is so with proof of shipment, then they can get that extra 70% from you. Or if you did negotiate hard, at least 40%, and then they don't get that last 30%. Ah, and then milk the cow. That is, you, you buy a, a smartphone, and then, they, then you say, oh, 
does headphones come with this? And then they'll say, oh, that will be another, you know, three US dollars on top of the FOB price. Ah, oh, um, what about the charger? Oh, that will be another five or six US dollars on the top of the FOB price. Oh, also, I want a special color on the packaging. Oh, that will be another, uh, you know, 50 cents on top of the FOB price. And so they start to milk you for those little bits that make your product saleable in your country. Uh, all right. So Shanghai surprise, you know, and these are really more elaborate scams where they actually hackers get into the email of real factories and then they send you an email. You think it's from the factory saying, oh, look, we have changed our bank account. We've closed it and you need to send your money to a new bank account. And you're none of the wiser because it comes from the same email that you were collaborating and communicating with that supplier you're working with. Uh, and then there's the Zhejiang one where the actual factory colludes with the hacker. All right. So let's get back to the blacklist data that we have tonight. So there's some background. All right. So is there some theory? Well, often the theory would basically the challenge is um, it's information asymmetry. That is, people know stuff that you don't know. You're a buyer. So you've got to use some control mechanisms, some governance mechanisms to actually bridge that information asymmetry gap. Bayman and Rajan 2000 talked about that. They tried to model that at the analytical level and really hasn't been tested at the empirical level. All right. And in the pursuit, you know, there's other papers in the supply chain area, like Hanley and Benton 2013 talk about it. Uh, Hornetel 2014 talk about it. They talk about this problem of even multinationals face when they're working with developing countries. But, you know, what's a picture that kind of summarizes this problem? We could start from the multinational point of view. Their challenge is to avoid political risk, xenophobic risk, and environmental risk. All right. And how do they do that? Because often it doesn't make sense for multinationals to make and have the brand of their own factory in a third world country. So, but if they, and obviously they'd like to have control, might make themselves, why? Because you have full control over the manufacturer of your product, you can control everything. But if your brand is on that factory, then you've got political, xenophobic, environmental risks. So what's the alternative? Well, then you outsource. You outsource to contractors. You outsource to EMS providers. Apple outsource to Foxconn, EMS provider. All right. You have Dyson vacuum cleaner. They outsource to Flextronics in Johor, Baru in Malaysia. All right. So you've got these contract manufacturers that multinationals outsource to. Then once you outsource to a third party, then you've got control costs, you've got coordination costs. So they, you know, these are these are theoretical notions in the literature uh, or the trade-off that between the make, or, this is the classic make or buy trade-off. Like even Apple gets around this political xenophobic environmental risk with particular suppliers by saying, oh, LG, you're making the touchscreen for, you know, our smartphone, we will put a machine in your factory and we will own that machine. We'll lease this machine to you, LG. You can, we will control 60% of the capacity of the machine for the next three years. You get to keep the machine at the end of three years. So why would Apple do that? Because no one knows that Apple is making stuff in that factory. So therefore, they minimize political, xenophobic, environmental risk. And then on the other side, it's their machine that's in the factory. So therefore, they get the benefit of control of that, what the supplier is doing for Apple. Um, OK, so multinationals, they have a lot of resources that they can throw at the problem that we're talking about tonight. All right. And, you know, there are always challenges in different countries where, you know, even in 2017, you know, the problem with China was cracking down on different factories and, you know, they would send people into the factories to just stop them operating. 
but then the factories operated at night time. So then they sent people into factories to smash the machines in, in the factory. So, you know, there's stuff, you know, this is what we mean by xenophobic environmental risks that you've got to be careful when you're working in other countries. Ah, now let's get back to the context for the SME. All right, so the best way the SME can protect what they're doing, that they don't have the resources and the where at all to you know, work in other countries is to have at least a minimum set of screening mechanisms, like you know, do proper selection, have some certification, do factory audits, have license verification. All right. Often, you know, the supply chain literature doesn't talk much about the selection stage. The supply chain literature talks a, a lot more about the developmental development of the supplier relationship. Uh, Cooper and Sagmolder, AOS 2004, and Krauss, all the work that Krauss has done with his uh, supply chain buddies in the global sourcing literature. Ah, and you know, so we're not looking at developing mechanisms. We're not looking at long-term context here. This is short-term context that SMEs face with the suppliers. Ah, so with the advent of the internet and the rise of cross-border e-commerce, obviously there are opportunities for suppliers to take advantage of SMEs because the SMEs cannot do what Apple do. SMEs cannot do what the multinationals uh, do to protect their interests. Ah, so here are the different governance mechanisms that we have observed with this supplier blacklist study. And that a, a range of screening mechanisms, a range of audit mechanisms, and a range of resolution mechanisms. Resolution, you know, contracts, contingency payments, the kind of resolution mechanism, it's a way of resolving if something goes wrong in the relationship. And I tell my global supply chain students, I say, yes, you need to have a contract, but a contract will not protect you. Don't see, don't see the contract as a way of making very, very clear the expectations of both parties. But if something goes wrong, don't count on taking that contract to the court to get your money back. It's not, it's this that could be the modus operandi for a multinational that has the resources and legal team to throw at suppliers that do them wrong. But for the SME, it's not going to, that is not the way that you want to see the contracts. The contracts in many ways is not providing the full insurance or protection, but it does at least provide a clarity of the expectations of both parties. Okay, so contracts are important. Contingency payments, as I said, 30, 40, 30, you know, this is critical. You can imagine why. And then you've got screening mechanisms and audit mechanisms. And so the big questions that we have in this study is, you know, there's the umbrella of governance mechanisms. Do governance mechanisms in procurement limit supplier opportunism? And then research question two, which governance mechanisms matter most alongside contracts? And then number three, what about the initial versus repeat order? And what about buyers from OECD versus non-OECD buyers? We, I, I'm sure there are many other cuts that we can do, but we're trying to focus on the relevance, like initial versus repeat order, the initial order, it's more likely you'll make mistakes. On a repeat order, it should be less likely. And it would be interesting to see the difference in that relationship. For OECD versus non-OECD, well, there are institutional differences that you grow up in. And you in OECD, you grow up in institutions where the legal system is strong. There's much more transparency about due process. And so you may see the, the necessity and the way that you execute contracts differently than if you grow up in a non-OECD environment. So, you know, these are theoretically why we chose to actually have these splits. Ah, so <laughs> there's an example. These are actual masks that I bought back <laughs> six months apart, you know, the cost of masks nearly uh, tripled and, you know, uh, 
enough of the mass. I've given you enough examples of that. But we've got originally we had proprietary data of over a thousand complaints from 2014 to 2017. But we since got data in 2018, 19, and 20, which added we're up to over 2,500 complaints now. And you could say, well, you know, Neil, uh, how do you know if the complaints are legitimate? Well, um, the short answer is we don't, but we can take steps to reduce the likelihood that we have fake complaints by looking at the narrative that goes behind the complaint. So when you make a complaint supplier blacklist, and actually all of you tonight can go to supplier blacklist and actually see the complaints I'm talking about, you can see there's an endless narration about what went wrong with a particular supplier. And so, you know, we can see that as we use as prime facie evidence to say that, well, you know, the data that we've got are more likely to be legitimate complaints than not. But that's always a question that you can have as an academic. All right, what about the problems encountered, All right? So, you know, we're a total of 2,252 here. A lot of problems were scams and other unethical activities. And when we say scams, that is buyers actually lost money. Okay, excuse me for a moment. Uh, contract violations, <laughs> the spelling here I need to fix, obviously a bit scammy in my English here, mislead times, lack of labour, price renegotiation, compromise, intellectual property. All right, what else do we know? A lot of the complaints were about consumer electronics. I always tell buyers, Amazon power sellers, if you want to sell something on Amazon and it's your very first time, stick with something like a soup ladle something that's made of plastic, something has no moving parts, no electronics, keep it simple. <laughs> Why? And if you look here, you'll see that the um, household clothing are much less represented versus electronic, industrial, and electronic components. Um, if you want to avoid scams altogether, maybe stick to sports and outdoor, okay? Uh, you know, and clothing less likely to be scammed. So, you, you know, there are obviously various product segments that are more risky than others. Ah, okay. Now, what about the top provinces where the scams in China happen? You know, 1782. Remember, we got scams from China and other developing countries uh, around the region, not just China. Obviously, a lot of them, consumer electronics being most of the scams, and the hotbed of consumer electronics is in Zhejiang, Jiangsu province around Shanghai, but also in Guangdong province. And as you can see, Guangdong, Xinjiang, and Zhejiang highly represented. Ah, what about the top 21 countries of buyers? Well, obviously there's buyers in China that have complained. There's a lot of buyers from the USA and that because there's a lot of purchasers from the USA. Okay, uh, Australia, India, UK, and like there's even Malaysia down here, and maybe maybe Egypt comes up here if we go down uh, low enough. Ah, so what uh, top provinces again, but top ten countries of buyers. Just to reiterate the point, we have a whole range of problems encountered by buyers from all over the world, including buyers from. China, including buyers from Pakistan, India, and other developing countries. Ah, what about the stage of the relationship? Most of the scams happened in the initial order and less so on the reorder. That's why we wanted to do that split. All right. So, you know, obviously you would expect to be less likely to be scammed on a reorder, but then, then talking to Charles, my friend on the ground over many, many years of uh, knowing him, he's told me that sometimes suppliers will let you have what you want on the first order, and then they'll get you on the second order. When you, on the first order, you may just order a Sam, you just may order 2000 units of something. But then on the second order, you end at 10,000 and then they scam you, all right? So don't just 
think that reorder, you know, you're protected versus initial order. It could go the other way. Ah, what about the formal contract? Well, nearly 80% of these complaints, they had a formal contract. Did they visit the production site? No. All right. All right. And as you saw from my initial videos of the factories, you know, there's so much you can see when you visit the production site. Okay. What about information the business license was accurate? Well, a majority of the complaints, the information was not accurate. And what about level of independent quality control? No independent QC took place 60% of the time. Wow. It's amazing that, you know, a little, you, you can spend 300 US dollars for a person day of a QC inspector to look at your product. And a lot of buyers still will not spend that money. Okay. Now, I don't get any kickback from any third party auditors from telling you this tonight, but I've just seen it from my very own eyes of buyers that have been scammed. Now, here's another thing that you want to be aware of. If for those of you who are serious about changing from academia and going into sourcing, is do not do B port and do not do EXW. Always stay with FOB because FOB is where the supplier has the responsibility to deliver your product to the container port nearest to the supplier. And at the container port, you can have the shipping inspectors, you can have proper documentation, you can have the final QC check done before the products go into the container. Because once it goes on the ship, there's no way that you can return your products um, economically. Of course you can, but it's just going to cost you 10 times more because you've got to pay customs duty to bring it back into the country. Uh, suppliers nationality, of course, there were the supplier representative, but also there's there was scammers in Hong Kong, in Vietnam, all right? Iran, Bulgaria, Egypt is here. Sorry, Mohammed. Uh, it, it, I'm sure there weren't many supplies from Egypt. All right, so, all right, so we've got everyone represented here. So we just want to be, you know, I, I, I just want to um, not pick on one single country. All right, so we've got our variable definitions. And what we're trying to model is uh, you know, logistical regression. If, if, the com if the complaint had any of these mechanisms in place that is independent variable is the objective function the likelihood of the objective function not being an outright uh, financial fraud is that significantly lower all right and you're probably thinking well neil that's just a you know what's special about that well we need, we can go into the discussion about that but as you can see what we find with 2168 complaints and we're trying to predict the probability of financial fraud, that is the buyers actually lost money, then it's if the buyers had verif verified the business, if they had visited the supplier, if they had FOB inco terms versus B port versus EXW, or if they had contracts, they're all significantly, re there's a significantly lower incidence of being frauded, be you know, frauded by the supplier. All right. All right. So, okay, Neil, what about when we use contracts? What is the effectiveness of other mechanisms? Well, when we have a contract, we've got 1789 complaints that used a contract. If they had verified the business, had a third party reference and a buyer visit, still there was a lower likelihood of being frauded. But if you had no contract, what was critical in reducing the incidence of fraud was whether you had a third party QC. So that is very interesting in and of itself. Right? A third party QC, you're actually getting someone external to your organization to do a double check on the product as it comes out of the factory. Ah, and so, you know, we can go to the split in terms of the results, and this is, gets back to our third big question. Is there a difference between the initial order and the repeat order? And what we find is that 
there is a difference when it comes to you know the effectiveness of the effectiveness of the buyer QC on the repeat order and the effectiveness of the verified business on the repeat order and the third party QC. But when it comes to contracting, contracts were definitely more effective in association with the reduced incidence of a fraudulent scam you know, where you lose your money when it was on the initial order, but not so effective when it comes to the repeat order. So it's very interesting there. You can imagine on the repeat order, you're getting into the relationship now, you're going beyond the contract and hopefully there's a little bit of trust in there. So you, you, you could say that this, you know, there's patterns there that are showing that there's trust development on the repeat order. So hence the contracts are not associated with the reduced likelihood of being scammed on the repeat order. And what about the difference between OECD buyers and non-OECD buyers? In some ways, we're proxying for the differences in the institutional environment in which the buyers are working in. Now, that's not to say that they're protected differently because just because you're from the US doesn't mean you can take a supplier in Vietnam to court in the USA. Uh, good luck in trying to do that unless you can actually get the supplier to physically go to the USA and make sure that the contract also has the jurisdiction in the USA and then that can happen. But it's not going to happen in the usual sense. If the buyer set out the scam, supplier set out to scam you, they're not going to go to your country if they know that the contract that they have signed has the jurisdiction of that country because you'll be caught at the border when you arrive. Ah, so for OECD buyers, you can see that the verified business, the buyer visit, third party QC, FOB, INCO terms is significantly associated and contracts significantly associated with reduced incidence of financial fraud. Specifically, if we look at the marginal effects, the verified business buyer visit and contracts. But for non-OECD buyers, we're seeing that the buyer visit still works. And, you know, it could be that, you know, across different institutions, that really plays up the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of contracts because of the difference in uh, legality and legal process in different institutions. But one thing that may be common across institutions is how you deal with face-to-face -face with your business partner. And so hence the buyer visit is effective in for buyers that come from both OECD and non-OECD countries. So, you know, the, there's some initial findings here that governance mechanisms seem to be associated with reduced incidence of financial fraud. And again, we define financial fraud. Remember, we have the what the biggest weakness of this paper is in identification. Like we do not have a sample of perfect suppliers to compare the non-perfect suppliers with. What we've got is a sample of suppliers that have been complained about. And then we've split that sample into the really bad suppliers that took your money and couldn't be contacted and the other suppliers that, well, maybe they, you know, sent you some poor quality products, but they made up for that on the second order or something like that after they were complained about or something like that. All right. So, you know, we obviously have an identification problem, but we believe that there is some prime facie evidence for the linkage between governance mechanisms and the reduced instance of this extreme form of supplier fraud. And we would say that that does contribute to the collaborative contracting literature, the work by Anderson Decker, Krishnan et al, uh, stuff published in Management Science, Contemporary Accounting Research, and you know, Costello, Journal of Accounting Economics, Feynman, Nessetine, analytically talked about this. Christian Miller and Sertol, Carr, 2011, Decker, 2008, AOS, Itnalaka, Naga and Rajan, 999, 
a seminal study that was in Journal of Accounting, Auditing and Finance many, many, many years ago. Ah, and then, you know, another contract, another contribution we think we believe we're contributing to the analytical literature that talks about supplier opportunism, that talks about, well, in this modeling world, this is how you should contract with your supplier in order to protect yourself against opportunism. Well, you know, there's been very few studies that have had the empirical data to try and test some of these issues. And we believe that we have some data to test some of the things that Chen and Lee talked about in their management science paper 2017. And then third, you know, we're contributing to the general organizational behavior literature and also some of the other researchers that looked at archival data as well. And so, you know, there's different disciplines that we have an opportunity to contribute to. This is in the early stages of this paper, this draft, and just want to thank you for joining me tonight for this presentation. This night, in terms of Hong Kong time, it's your afternoon if you're in Europe. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, back to your desk. Uh, thank you very much, dear Dr. Neil, for your contribution and your effort. It's really an excellent uh, presentation and excellent paper. Thank you very much. Uh, now, if anyone has any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Simon Houston Please. here. Yeah, just wondering, are these authorities, you would have thought the authorities would close down some of these businesses? Or that doesn't happen. They can continue with these scams. Uh, Simon, that's a, that's a good question. You know, at the start, about a decade ago, the initial you know, platforms, Alibaba was very big, made in China, very big. They had a lot of problems and in many ways they've cleaned up their act in the past decade, but it, it is still buyer beware on this. And I think the initial problems, you go back in the 2011, 2012, 2013, you go to alibaba.com, the platform, Alibaba was actually suppliers were paying Alibaba to actually get good ratings to for Alibaba to say that this supplier is a good supplier and you can trust this supplier. Uh, uh, that is sort of, that's one thing that they crack down on, the authorities, and that they don't longer do that, but that doesn't stop uh, suppliers registering with Alibaba. And it's just a matter of buyers need to do their due diligence uh, no matter what. But very, very good question, Simon. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Man here. Uh, I had a hard time uh, distinguishing the two types of opportunism. And uh, the idea was that we want to be rational as a business and we want to be opportunistic. We are there to make profit. But then again, fraud, is it opportunism or is it outright something criminal? So, uh, so yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. That's something that we've got to clarify in this paper. How we defined it was when the complaint made it very, very clear that the buyer lost money, number one. And number two, they could not contact the supplier. So they'll email, the phone call, but no response. Uh, so that's how we defined this opportunism. And you're right, is that criminal? Yes. Is it possible to take suppliers to court in a developing country? Uh, yes, it is. My friend, Mike Bellamy, who worked uh, in China for many, many years, almost two decades, I think, he has taken suppliers to court on seven times and won seven times. Uh, and in order to take the suppliers to court, you need to have proper documentation. And so there are, there are, there are processes in developing countries for bringing suppliers to account. And that's really up to the buyer to initiate this and not for the various regulatory 
bodies to clamp down on such uh, suppliers. But I can imagine if, you know, a country gets, when a country gets a reputation like the EU, excuse me, <coughs> the EU or USA complained to China in 2020, like EU saying, what are you doing here, China? You are sending us masks and they are not, they are fake masks. What are you doing about this? And it actually prompted the China government to force all factories. This is early three months into 2020. We're talking about April, March, April, 2020. It forced China, China, China said to all factories, okay, if you're making masks for export, you need to register your business, your factory business, and comply with the standards for you to supply those same product domestically in some ways, which was a much higher standard. And so that stopped a lot of factories um, outright. So yes, uh, China did do that. And then the next step they did less than three or four weeks later into April, 2020, they actually forced, uh, you know, they actually dialed up the customs inspection of PPE leaving China because the China government didn't want the criticism from the EU or the US or other countries because it got to a it got to a national level, a state level, when PPE was going into these countries and they were fake. And like you know, before that, you know, before 2020, yes, there were, you know, fake goods going into these countries, but they didn't affect, they didn't go to the core of the health of the population in that country. And so this is what made uh, riled EU and the US. And then at the state level, they lobbied China and then China took action. So it happened in 2020, but it really didn't happen for the decade leading up to 2020. But very, very good question, man. Yeah, other questions. If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Yeah, Neil, another uh, question I have. Uh, uh, the yeah. question is, uh, your uh, measurement for a contract, uh, is it just the presence or absence of contract or is it much more than that? It's a oh, good question. It's a presence or absence. And you're right, there are good and bad contracts. But at the moment, as we, you know, it's very, very clear. Did you have a contract? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I noticed uh, Edgar, you're on uh, our call. So thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, Walid, uh, firstly, uh, a question from uh, Professor uh, Edgar uh, from Germany. Oh, Edgar. By letter crypt by more as opposed to TC. Edgar, oh, that's a very good question. And by the way, just um, okay. Letter of credit as opposed to TT. Letter of credit, you know, obviously is give, provides protection to the buyer because a letter of credit forces a financial institution to become a middle person in the movement of the financial payment between the buyer and the supplier. And a lot of suppliers don't like that because it forces the supplier to, you know, have the proper standards in place or, you know, they're actually making promises that are part of that letter of credit because the supplier knows that if they don't fulfill those promises, then the financial institution will not release the money. And so a lot of suppliers don't like letter of credit uh, as opposed to TT, yeah. So for the buyer, letter of credit, definitely much more protective of the buyer's interests, but suppliers don't always like that, especially if it's a small order. Very, very good question. Edgar, thanks for joining tonight too, just for the audience here. Thank you. Yeah, are there another questions? Uh, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, uh, Neil, another question. So, if, yeah. if you allow. <laughs> yeah. 
most of these transactions seem to be arm's length transaction. And you also mentioned repeat orders. And you also mentioned some building of trust. Uh, um, and in these arm length transactions, uh, uh, you were talking about the screening mechanisms and audit mechanisms and governance mechanisms like contracts and you know, subcontingency there. Right. But anything yes. can happen in, in these uh, arm's length. Uh, uh, so if, if a supplier is bent on doing fraud, uh, so the question is now, if a supplier is bent on doing fraud, how? Yes. Uh, people, maybe. If your question, I didn't get the last part. If the supplier is bent on doing fraud, so. Then... So the idea here is that uh, we have some screening mechanism and if a supplier is bent on doing fraud. So what is actually, what, uh, so when I look at your data or when I look at the table, so what is there? The screening mechanism helps me avoid bad suppliers or? Um, correct, for example, uh, um, and I, 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 I do this example with, I get my supply chain students to I think last semester, just a few months ago, they all had to buy, they had to go to Alibaba and buy a 8 inch tablet, uh, put an order with a spy, not put an order, but just get a request for quotation for 50 tablets. And so then the students had to learn the questions to ask. So you can, there's a lot of information you can get from the supplier's website. So first of all, as I showed you earlier, the website, you know, it looks, the website I showed you earlier was obviously a scam by the way the information is presented on the website. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number two, there's other things that you can find out from the supplier online. And that is you can actually check for the different licenses that they have. Now, all suppliers can, it's easy to copy a license, but what you can do, so for example, you're selling electrical items in the USA and there's the, um, uh, you know, there, there's the different standards that the electrical product has to meet in the USA. And so what the supplier needs to have to have if the factory is certified, they will have a certificate number. Then you can go to the website of that standards body in the USA and you'll go down, find that number and you'll see the name of the factory. So you can actually cross check. You can do a lot of checking online to screen out a good supplier, good supplier from a bad supplier. All right. Uh, HDMI is another example, especially in electronics that are, you know, computers, tablets, that have the HDMI interface, then you can you can ask the supplier, do you have the HDMI license? Oh, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, now here it is here. Oh, can you give me the number? And then you take that number, you go to the HDMI website and look up that number and see if the supplier's factory name, their business registration is listed on the HDMI website. So these are things that you can do even before you visit the supplier. So you, you can weed out those suppliers that have set up uh, fake fronts to actually uh, defraud you. Yep. Sorry, my bad. I actually missed on, uh, so I don't know why I missed on this one. So it actually allows us to distinguish between. So if we have all these mayors, so we will end up with a good supplier. Yep. Yes, correct. Yes. But I can tell you the big thing that if you ask me, Neil, is there a silver bullet that best, what's the silver bullet that best protects the buyer? And I can tell you, it's probably not a silver bullet. It's probably just a copper bullet, but it's pretty close. And that is uh, visit the factory. That's it. And that's the biggest problem for 2020 and 2021. It's so hard, not just China, but other countries, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, you know, other developing country suppliers. It is so hard to visit factories because of the border closures. So what do you have to do? You have to employ a third party proxy, someone you trust 
in that country to visit the factory for you. And that's the big advice that uh, we give. And, you know, uh, there's one thing to do is to do that. Thanks a lot, Niels. I really enjoyed your presentation and uh, thanks a lot for uh, Thank you. There is another question, uh, question from Walid Fathi. Uh, Dr. Dell, uh, uh, please, uh, what is the impact of uh, discovering fraudulent suppliers on the financial statement? Uh, can you just uh, ask that again, please? What is the the impact of discovering a fraudulent suppliers on financial statements. Ah, the, ah, okay. So in other words, looking at the financial statements of suppliers, can that give you some indication of, or enable you to distinguish between a good supplier and a bad supplier or a fraudulent supplier and non-fraudulent supplier? Is that basically your question? Uh, the, is that Financial uh, financial impact uh, uh, in stage of uh, uh, preparation preparation of uh, statement uh, and um, and the users. Uh, what deal with uh, the company? Oh, okay. I'm not sure if I answer, but I'll answer. I assume there's you know there's two types of questions possibly here. The financial impact for the buyer is in the you know you talk about the. In the last two years, you know, the amount of fraud is in the hundreds of millions, especially with the PPE. Okay, so it's it's huge, and it's huge for the SME. All right, multinationals wear a you know a percentage of this, and that's why multinationals are big. They can wear that they have the resources to do that, and they don't always report that. But the SMEs, the financial consequences are huge. That's something, but. Wallet, if that's the question you're asking, that's something that we need to make clearer in the paper. And that is, you know, how economically, what is the significance of this problem? And that's something that we need to dig a little bit deeper on and make it clearer in the paper. Now, if your question is about the financial, can you use the statements of the supplier's financial position to learn about the supplier. Uh, yes, you can, because it also and depends on which country that the supplier is in. So in China, every year suppliers have to, their companies have to produce an annual report. And that's, you can actually pay a service like Credit Eyes in Shanghai. You pay them a certain amount of money, about 50 US dollars, and you can get them, they can actually look up the supplier that you are trying to screen, and they will actually get the annual reports that that supplier has submitted to the provincial authority. Now, of course, you, you don't know if that's real or fake, but you know, these are little things that there are agents in these various countries already there that you can use to help sharpen your due diligence of on the suppliers. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Musa. Yeah, is there another question? Uh, so wanna, if, you, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, question, uh, uh, one ask about it. Uh, uh, what do you think about adding uh, the, uh, the more variable moderating variables or mediation variables uh, such as uh, the cultural diversity in this relationship? Um, such as what culture difference or? Uh, uh, cultural uh, diversity. Diversity. Uh, cu cultural diversity? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, so we've got to think. Okay, so if you start talking about cultural diversity, then it's possible in some ways we thought about that. We've got the OECD, non-OECD, because we were focusing much more on the institution difference. But it's possible that you know a PhD student can come along and look at our data and then say, oh, I want to study the buyers that come from a low power distance, high individualism country, 
and how they are controlling their contracting with a supplier from high power distance, low individuals. So, you know, you could theoretically set up a model like that from the data and then use that to segregate the data and, and, and then test a particular model. Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, and another variable such as uh, 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 political uh, uh, contract. What do what you think about the variables we can just... Um, what's, what's that other variable you're saying? Uh, political uh, contract. The, could you type it in the chat room? The, what contract? Uh, policy, uh, political contract. Yeah, I'm not hearing that one. Uh, questions about how you how you deal uh, dealing uh, uh, with uh, the indigenous problem in uh, in the empirical test. Ah, okay. So, all right, uh, endogeneity. One, you know, so you know, econometric econometric question here. The best way that we could deal with endogeneity here. Number one, oh, we. Number one is we could parse the data in terms of, you know, before 2020 and or before, 29, before 2020 and after 2020. We can parse the data on particular years to see if we get similar results over the years. So that's one way. Another way of looking at endogeneity is to think of other instrumental variables and then split the data on those instrumental variables. I think one thing that we are going to do is actually look at the complaints that were registered in uh, 2020 and see how they are different for the same product segments compared to 2019 and before. Because obviously in 2020, you have border closures. So there's some governance mechanisms that you cannot do that you could do before 2020. Um, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor uh, Neil Bonor, uh, for your contribution and your effort. It's really an excellent uh, presentation and excellent uh, paper. Thank you very much. And it's all that remains for me to say is uh, thank you, everyone that's joined us. And I thank you very much for taking the time I want to present to us today, dear Dr. Neil Akron. It's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me onto your platform. Appreciate that. And I think it's wonderful. Yeah. And I, and I hope to see you soon in Egypt, dear Prof. You are very, very welcome. Okay. I'll hang on to that uh, invite and make sure I get across there one day. Thank you.